both of these questions are exactly exam level acceleration problems. Okay, I would have a little more detail. Okay, like there would be a context to the question. It would be a car or a plane or something. Okay, it wouldn't just be like this thing is doing this. Um, but this is the type of question that you would see, and it's exactly what was on your worksheet there that you guys hopefully got finished yesterday. It's, it sounds like you didn't get to the second podcast, but that you did finish the acceleration stuff at least. Okay, all right. So for our first uh, question here, okay, give them a mark first for their givens. It tells us that the final velocity of a boat is, uh, or we're looking for the final velocity of the boat. So it's our question mark. It's We're told that it starts from rest. So VI is zero. Okay, we're told that it accelerates for 13.4 seconds and that the acceleration, the rate of acceleration is four and a half meters per second squared. So one mark for that. Okay, they get one mark for picking the correct formula, which is pretty easy because it was an acceleration quiz and that's your only formula that involves that. Okay, but we have to manipulate in order to get VF. So what we're going to do is multiply both sides by T. So that's that operation there. Okay, T comes over to this side and then we add VI. VI was zero anyway, so we don't even need to bother adding it. Okay, we can just get rid of it. Uh, and we have T times A equals VF. All right, so zero plus, so give them a mark if they got to this point here. Okay, they either have T times A equals VF or VI plus T times A if they, okay, um, if they wrote that, they didn't have to because VI was zero. Uh, and then another mark here for plugging in the numbers correctly, they don't have to have the zero plus as long as they have the 13.4 times 4.5. And we should get a final answer of 60.3 meters per second. Okay, awesome. You should always write the formula yes, because I always give a mark for it. Okay, so that is one of the steps that should be there. Obviously, if they got everything right, they can have all the marks, but okay. The problem is if you don't get it all right, you don't get that mark. Uh, no, it should be 60.3, so they won't get a mark. Make sure it's got units as well, guys. Um, and I will accept it without direction because they gave us no directions in the question. Okay, so it's really not a velocity, it's a speed because they didn't give us any directions in the question. Okay, any other questions on number one? Okay. So question number two is telling us an object reached a speed of 29 meters per second. That's our final velocity after accelerating at seven meters per second squared. So that's our rate of acceleration for 2.9 seconds. We're looking for the initial velocity. So give them a mark if they had their givens written down. A mark for the acceleration formula, which we are now going to manipulate for VI. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by T. Then I'm gonna add VI to both sides. And then I'm going to subtract T times A over to this side in order to leave VI by itself and positive. So if they have this manipulation, that is their third mark. Their fourth mark is for plugging the numbers incorrectly, 29 meters per second minus seven times 2.9. And we should get um, 8.7 meters per second as our initial speed. Okay, because it's speed, it has no direction. Um, I'm okay if they didn't put units on, but they should in the future. Okay, all right, so the whole quiz is out of 10 marks. Please give them a mark out of 10 at the top where I can see it. Okay, let them see it. And then I would like them on the desk in front of Sean in a nice neat pile, please. Okay, so for the past while here we've been talking about acceleration if you cause something to accelerate its velocity changes okay if you gain velocity that is have a positive acceleration what else do you now have more of you have more energy what kind kinetic right you have more kinetic energy as a result of increasing your velocity or speed okay if I'm going to increase the velocity of something and thus its energy, what do I have to do? I have to do work, okay? When we first started this unit, we talked about how work was a change in mechanical energy, okay? And that heat was a change in thermal energy. So we're done talking about the heat stuff. Now we're gonna talk about, okay, this mechanical energy stuff that causes or is caused by, okay, um, something accelerating or something changing position, okay, things like that. So the work energy theorem is basically the idea that makes or that accounts for, okay, the changes in energy that occur all the time. 
Okay, in my mind, it's the most important concept there is in physics because nothing happens without it. Okay, I mean, you probably all had that experience where you know, your mom or dad says, you know, go out and shovel the walk or go out and mow the lawn. Oh, I can, I've got no energy. Yeah, except that you're lying because you do have energy. If you didn't, you'd be dead. Okay, and if you were dead, you wouldn't say, I have no energy because obviously be dead. So um, you do have energy, you just don't want to do it. Okay, you have to have energy in order to do work because work is a basic. Uh, no, that's, that's sort of true. It wasn't where I was going. Okay, if I do work on something, what do I change? It's energy. Okay, so they, they are like a chicken and the egg kind of a relationship. Okay, work is a change in mechanical energy. Okay, that's what delta means, remember, delta is change. Okay, so work is a change in mechanical energy, which means, essentially, work is the final mechanical energy minus the initial mechanical energy. Work can be positive and it can be negative. Okay, if I do work on something, like let's say, um, I don't know, I pick something up off the floor and put it on a desk. From my point of view, that work is negative. Why? All right, I've lost energy. I've transferred it to whatever it is I picked up off the floor. From the object's point of view, the work is positive. It now has more energy. Okay, so work can be positive or negative depending on whether you're receiving or giving the energy away. Okay. All right, so work energy theorem, okay, is that work and energy can be equal, but one cannot exist without the other, okay? You can't do work without energy because work is a transfer of energy. You can't get energy unless something does work on you, okay? Or you consume chemical energy and then it gets converted into other forms, whatever, okay? You can't essentially do one without the other. Now, in order to make something accelerate, we have to do work. What does that look like? What does work look like? Pushing. pushing, okay, yeah, pushing, pulling, exerting a force, okay, so force is also part of this, okay? You have to exert a force, and you have to do that over a what? Okay, yes, over a time, but also over a distance. Objects gotta move, okay? You don't do any work on an object if it doesn't move, because its velocity won't change and its position won't change if it doesn't move, okay? so. Force times distance is work, which also equals, again, the final energy minus the initial mechanical energy. Okay. So if I exert a force on something over a distance, I change either the potential energy of the object or the kinetic energy of the object or both. Right? If I'm rolling something up a ramp, it's possible that I could be changing both kinds. I might be making it go faster as well as giving it potential energy because it will be higher off the ground at the end of the ramp. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Awesome question. Um, no, I'm gonna say no on that. It's yes and no, but more no um, for this reason. Once an object has energy, that energy is a scalar quantity. If I have a certain amount of energy, I could use that energy to do anything. Therefore, it can't really have a direction, okay? So while we might calculate that distance by going final position minus initial position could be a straight line, okay? It's still a scalar quantity. The only reason I put a positive or a negative on is to not show that it's, that it's moving in an upward or backward direction, but to convey whether I'm gaining it or losing it, okay? Everyone follow there? Right? Like money doesn't have a vector, okay? But if I'm in the hole, I'm negative money, okay? If I'm not in the hole, I'm positive money. It just not doesn't mean it has a direction. It just means you have it or you are in debt of it, right? Okay, so um, kinetic energy is something you have if you are moving, okay? And potential energy is something you have because of either your position or your state, okay? State would be more like chemical energy, um, but position is more about gravitational potential energy. And that's the kind of potential energy we're gonna deal with most, okay, is gravitational potential energy. Anytime something is not on the ground, it has gravitational potential energy because it could what? It could fall, okay? 
Anything that is that has the ability to fall has the potential to fall, and thus the potential to do work. Again, I think I used this example before. If I'm holding this hole punch okay, above my feet, it has the potential to fall. If it fell and hit my feet, what would it do? Yeah, okay, it would do work on my feet. Not a desirable kind. Okay, It would change the shape of my feet. Okay, like crush a toe or something like that. That counts as work. Okay, when you change the shape of something, you've done work. You've exerted a force over a distance. Does everyone follow on that? Okay, all right. In this situation right here, am I doing work? Really? It seems like I should be. Okay, I did hear a creak. Pretend it didn't creak. Am I doing any work right now? Nope. Okay. Why am I getting tired then? Because I'm out of shape. I know. I'm old. Okay. Why am I getting tired? If I'm not doing any work, I shouldn't be transferring any energy anywhere. The wall isn't moving. It did, but it didn't. We're pretending it didn't. Okay. Because I felt superhuman there for a second. Okay. The wall, in for all intents and purposes, did not move. Okay. Nor did it change any shape. Forget about the creaking sound. Okay. If I didn't do any work, I shouldn't be losing any energy. Agreed? I didn't do any work on the wall. Did I do work on anything else? Yep. Okay. There was some work done on the surroundings. Okay. When I pushed on the wall, what does the wall have to do? It's got to push back. Okay. Which means the, the force the wall exerts back on me shortens my muscles, right? Because when your muscles contract, they get shorter. There's the distance over which the force of the wall acted on me. So I have to use other muscles in my body to balance against the force of the wall pushing on me, okay? As a result, my muscles all contract, okay? They start using energy and I lose energy as heat. If I kept doing that, I'd get all sweaty, okay? And that energy would go to the environment, okay? Not necessarily work, but my energy is changing. From my point of view, it's negative work. I'm losing energy even though I'm doing nothing productive. Okay. All right. So energy is a measurable quantity. Hard to measure, hard to see, hard to quantify, but it's there. Okay. Um, and that was, of course, the big problem we talked about early on in the unit with people ha coming up with what was energy. Oh, it was invisible fluid and all that kind of stuff. Well, it really wasn't. Okay. Um, but we can see the results of energy all the time. Okay. In a simple mousetrap, Okay, we can see energy conversions from one form to another. How many people have ever set a mousetrap before? Okay, the classic kind like this, right? Okay, so you have in the in the mousetrap you have uh, the trigger. Okay, that's this piece here. That's the trigger. Okay, uh, this is the locking bar. Okay, this is the the loading spring, and this is the killing bar. That's what it's called. It's the killing. Well, that's what it does. It breaks the necks of mice, okay? Um, it's about as humane a way as you can kill a mouse. And I mean, people are like, well, it poison it. Well, you know what? Poison doesn't have, like, they don't drop dead after eating poison. They suffer for a while after. This is actually more humane, okay? If you're into killing mice humanely, that's more humane, okay? Um, so when you have this, when you set one of these mouse traps, you have to pull the, the, the spring and the killing bar this way, okay? You have to pull it from over here, okay? through this arc and then set it here and, and clip the, the locking bar into the trigger. Okay, everyone follow there. All right, what have I done in moving the bar over? I've done work, okay? Because what have I done to the spring? Yeah, I've stretched it or compressed it or changed its shape somehow that has put it into a, more, a higher energy condition. Okay? That's what you do with springs when you change their shape. You put them into a higher energy condition. Regardless of whether you're compressing a spring or stretching a spring, springs work in both directions. Okay, So any change in shape is you exerting a force over a distance. Okay, The distance would be the length that you stretch the spring. The force would be however hard you have to push or pull. Okay, So in doing this, I have done work. And that work is now being stored as elastic potential energy. Okay, elastic potential energy has, is the type of potential energy in anything due to a change in shape that can return. Okay, so anything that can return to an original shape is referred to as elastic. Springs are elastic, bungee cords are elastic, rubber bands, okay, stuff like that. 
and trampolines, all that kind of stuff. They're all elastic because they have this desire to return to their original shape. A bow and arrow, okay, or the bow, not the arrow, okay? The bow uses elastic potential energy in order to fire an arrow. When you pull the two ends of it together, you've changed its shape. The wood wants to return to its original shape, okay? That's where the stored energy comes from. All right, when the trigger is triggered, then the spring releases all of its stored energy and it turns from potential into kinetic, okay? Because the bar moves very quickly, right? It gains a high rate of speed and then smashes down on the unfortunate mouse, okay, that happens to be in it. Okay, everybody follow me there. When it does hit the mouse, is it doing work? Yep, its velocity is changing. When it hits the mouse, it slows down, okay? A little, well, it slows down more from hitting the board, but whatever, okay? It's still slowing down. It's changing the shape of the mouse, okay, in, in a undesirable slash desirable way, okay? Um, and and then it's it's also making some other forms of energy. Sound, yeah, if you've ever like triggered one of these yourself, okay, they're loud, like they make that wicked snapping sound, okay? There's a lot of energy stored in there and they'll actually jump a little bit too if you've just like triggered them with a stick or something, they actually jump right off the floor, okay? There's a lot of energy stored in that spring. Okay. Um, I know in science, uh, like 24, when I used to teach that course, we used to build carts and they were powered by a mousetrap. So you'd have to put a mousetrap on it in such a way that you could trigger the mousetrap and then the mousetrap swinging down had to propel the car, right? And so you could, and you could uh, I had one kid who got his to go all the way and hit the back wall, okay, just off of that. That was more about the efficiency of the wheels rather than the energy in the mousetrap, but still there's a lot of energy to propel a car that far, okay, awesome. Well, a lot of it is sound. The, it's still, the, the trap bounces, the mouse moves, right? I mean, there's there's a fair amount of movement uh, resulting from the, the spring snapping down. So um, there's other forms of energy that it becomes, right? Yes, it's doing some work on the mouse, but it's not using all of its energy to do that, okay? It's, a lot of it is lost as sound. There's some heat from it snapping against the board, stuff like that. Okay, so big thing to remember here, okay, uh, is that uh, energy is a measure Okay, of an object or system's capacity to do work. Okay, and work is the transfer of energy from one object or system to another. So you can see their definitions are very intertwined. Okay, if you don't have energy, you can't do work. If you, okay, if you want to have energy, something's got to do work on you. Okay, questions on that? That's just definitions of work and energy. And they're important because we come back to that all the time. Okay, and sometimes in a problem, the way a problem might be stated might be helping to you to decide whether it's an energy problem or a work problem or whether it's got both in it. Okay. Okay, classic example here of a person swinging a tennis racket. Okay, you throw the tennis ball up in the air. That's this little arc. Okay, that you can kind of see right here. Okay, that's the arc of the tennis ball. Um, the tennis ball is moving straight up and down when you throw it, but when you hit it with the racket, it begins to move this direction. Why? Okay, you're doing work because the racket's exerting force over over a distance. Okay, so much of what we do in 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 uh, sports and things like that is related to the work energy theorem. Okay, any sport that has any kind of technological design associated with it, okay, uh, you know, rackets, uh, sticks, okay, things like that. Um, a lot of physics has gone into the design of those because two things can affect how fast the implement, whatever it is, ball, puck, whatever, moves after you have made contact with it. Okay, there's only two ways I can increase the velocity of my serve. I can get stronger or I can improve my technique slash technology. Okay, those are the only two ways that I can make this ball go faster because there's only two parts of the work energy theorem that I can change. The force, which is my strength, okay, or the distance over which I exert that force. Okay, the bigger the distance over which I exert the force, the more energy that 
thing will gain because the more work I will do on it, right? If D gets bigger, W gets bigger. Everyone okay with that? Okay, and if force gets bigger, W gets bigger. All right, so with a tennis racket, okay, the tennis racket is, it uses strings, okay, that are strung between the, the ring of the racket. Why is that superior to a big paddle? Okay, A, the strings are elastic. What else? Less drag. It's way harder to pull a paddle through the air because there's more surface area for air resistance, okay, than it is something hollow, okay, like, like a tennis racket. So the air goes through the face of a tennis racket way easier than the face of a paddle. It's lighter, okay, which means I can make it move faster, okay, with whatever strength I have. So um, part of the reason rackets are designed the way they are is to enable us to make them move faster. That's part of their technological design, okay? But we also want to um, increase the amount of time the ball is in contact with the face of the racket, okay? So there's some things that we do there. The design of the strings inside helps us to increase the amount of time the ball sits on the face. The ball itself is designed to change shape so that it sits on the face tenths, maybe hundredths of a second longer, okay? Anything that changes the amount of time or distance over which I can exert that force means I'm going to do more work. Everybody follow on that, okay? So modern tennis rackets are no longer made out of wood. They're made out of like carbon fiber, okay? Things like that, it's a similar material to what hockey sticks are made out of. Hockey sticks work the same way, okay? Back in, back in my day, hockey sticks were made out of a piece of tree, okay? Wood is reasonably flexible, Okay, it can it can flex a little bit. Okay, but the range you can bend a wooden stick might be something like this. Okay, the range you can bend a composite or graphite or carbon fiber stick is more like that. They're far more flexible. Of course, they break a lot more easily. Okay, but if on most of my shots I can maintain contact with the puck over this distance compared to this distance, how much faster does the puck come off the stick? A lot faster. This is almost twice the distance I could exert a force over than a wooden stick. Okay. Now there's a delicate balance there. If you make the stick too flexible, it becomes floppy. Okay. And that's no good. If we want it to be stiff, and we want it to actually snap a little bit on the forward end because then it's not just my my strength, it's also potential energy that gets stored in the stick. Okay? The stick becomes elastic. Right? And when when it's when I'm done pushing on it and the puck is still on the, the blade of the stick, the stick actually snaps a little bit more, okay, and gives it that extra little flick. Okay, that gives it a little extra speed that it wouldn't have gotten off a wooden stick. Okay, so I can shoot the puck faster that way okay golf similar thing okay they, they change the design of clubs to make them lighter and easier to swing so that we can increase the velocity at which they move and ball technology has gotten to the point now where a ball when it hits the face of a club squishes flat okay it squishes flat against the face so here's the face of the club okay when a ball is in contact with it the ball looks like this it's flat on one side Okay, and that makes it stay against the face of the club for longer, and then it bounces off the face of the club, okay, and springs forward, and you get it to go further, all right? Now, the other place we said um, that we could improve this would be our technique, okay? Technique and technology are the two places where you can increase distance, okay? If I have better technique, then uh, obviously I can exert maybe a little bit more force, but also increase the distance over which that force acts, Okay, everyone follow me there. Okay. The only sport that has not embraced any of this is what? No, oh, I just mentioned golf. Basketball. Nope, nope, basketball has improved the design of shoes. Okay, um, use different materials for backboards that allow you to have more control over spin. Baseball. Okay, baseball has focused entirely on this part of the equation. Okay, a Louisville slugger is still a piece of tree. It's exactly the same as it was 100 years ago. Okay, bats are exactly the same, at least in the major leagues, because they're only allowed to use wooden bats. Okay, um, unless you're Barry Bonds and you cork your bat, which is cheating. Okay, why is corking your bat cheating? Yeah, it makes it lighter. So you drill it out and you fill it with cork. Okay, and so you can swing it faster. 
just cheating and he got caught okay because those bats do tend to break more often and of course then when the umpire picks it up he goes hmm this bat's not right okay and you get caught but most of the focus has been on this in the form of anabolic steroids sorry if you're a baseball player i'm sorry but baseball is ripe with cheaters okay I don't know how many times there's been like steroid scandals in baseball because really they have not allowed this part of the equation to be focused on. Okay. And that means that guys have got to just, you know, go on the roids and become a roid monkey. Okay. And, and get really strong. And so they can swing the bat faster. Okay. Cause that's really the only thing that makes you hit the ball further. Okay. The ball is still like horse hide and, and it's sewn together and all of that. The technology really hasn't changed. Uh, depends. If they were able to make them out of another material, they'd be able to swing them faster. You wouldn't really want a bat that flexes very much, okay? Which is why they're not allowed to use aluminum bats, right? Like an aluminum bat, you can swing faster because it's a little bit lighter, right? Uh, well, no, yes, yes, it would. But the force would be, um, yeah, it's kind of this part of it. I'm trying to make what the ball has kinetic energy so i'm changing this part of it yeah the faster i can swing the bat the better okay um and if the bat's lighter then i can swing it faster so it's still kind of this this part the force part but yeah. okay so when you're thinking about that okay that's something that that kind of is a basic physical principle that all things i mean i'm talking about sports mostly here but it's, it's useful in all parts of life the longer the distance over which you can do work, the more energy something is going to gain, okay? Or the more force you use, okay, the more energy it's going to gain. Simple example of that in everyday life would be the use of a ramp. So let's say you have a large block, a very large block, okay? It's made out of concrete. Okay. You have to lift it, or you have to get it somehow onto this platform up here. Okay, the platform is let's say one meter high. Okay, so it's one meter above the ground. You have two choices: you can push it up a ramp, or you can lift it onto the platform. Which is easier? Pushing it up the ramp is easier. Okay, provided the ramp is frictionless. Okay. Um, we're going to say it is. It would be easier to push it up the ramp. In which case do I do more work? Lifting it on or pushing it up the ramp? It's both the same. I do the same amount of work regardless of how it gets onto this platform. Okay, this is the whole reason we invented the ramp. Okay, it's an inclined plane. The inclined plane is the simplest machine. Okay. If I push this thing up the ramp, I don't have to use as much what? Force. But I have to use less force over a greater distance. Remember, force times distance equals the change in energy. When this thing is sitting right here, it has a certain amount of energy, regardless of how it got there. It has a certain amount of energy. Okay, So lifting it there or pushing it up a ramp gives it a certain amount of energy. All that changes is the amount of force required to do it. If I lift it, I use a lot of force over a short distance. If I push it up the ramp, I use less force over a greater distance, but I end up with the same change in energy. Okay, everybody with me there? Okay. So the work energy theorem is kind of the, the kind of motivating force behind a lot of technologies and, and tools and, and machines. All right. Okay, so work is also related to the force acting on an object. Okay, so we talked about distance, okay, but it's also related to the force. The greater the force, okay, so work is related to the force acting on an object. Greater the force, the more work is done, okay, on objects of the same mass. Okay, mass also affects the amount of work done as a more massive object would require more energy to move, okay, for this reason. If I'm looking at force times distance and I'm trying to lift something, Okay. If I'm lifting something, I'm changing what kind of energy? Potential. I'm changing its potential. And provided I'm not accelerating, if I just lift it at a constant speed, I change its potential energy. Your potential energy is based on three things. Your mass, 
the acceleration due to gravity, which on Earth is always going to be the same number, and the height to which you lift the object. All right. If I have a one kilogram object and a 10 kilogram object and I lift them both onto the desk, which one requires more work? The 10 kilogram object is heavier. Okay, so to lift a 10 kilogram object to the same height requires more force. Okay, all right, when you're using a bow, okay, when you bend the bow, you pull back on the string. Okay, so you pull back on the string, that forces the two ends together. Okay, you exert a force this way over this distance. Okay, or the, the bow is resisting by you know changing its shape to this distance instead. When you release it, it snaps back and pulls the string with it. Yeah, it pull instead of you pulling the string backwards, the bow pulls the string forwards. And if there's an arrow in the string or attached to the string at that point, the arrow is propelled forwards. Okay. Let's say that I pull back, I draw back a bow with an arrow in it. When I draw back the bow, I do 200 joules worth of work. How much energy is in the bow? 200 joules. I release the string. The arrow flies out of the bow. How much energy does the arrow have? 200 joules. Okay, that's the work energy theorem. Okay, it's also tied into the law of conservation of energy. Okay, provided there were no other places where energy was lost, and of course there always are, okay, the energy would all go into the arrow. In the real world, it wouldn't because you hear a bow, okay, when you fire it, and okay, when you release it, you hear the string snap, okay, things like that. All right. So, for force to transfer energy to the object, the force must make the object move. Doesn't mean the whole object has to move. The particles in the object have to move. Sometimes they all move together, and that means the whole object moves. Okay, But sometimes they don't. So example one, person using a golf club in the proper fashion. Okay, They use the amount of force they're capable of exerting, Okay, F, on a very small mass, the golf ball, and they produce a very large what? Force. Acceleration. Okay, they produced a very large acceleration. Okay, now they wind up and hit this truck for whatever reason. Okay, they're going to do the same amount of work on the truck that they did on the golf ball, if all other things are the same. Okay, but they're using the same amount of force, F on a much greater mass and producing a much smaller acceleration. Okay? In fact, realistically, is the truck going to move? No. The truck is not going to roll forwards as a result of being hit by a golf club, even if it's swung by the most powerful golf club swinger okay, ever. All right? That's still not going to do anything. But if I'm standing right here with my hand on the hood of the, of the truck, will I know when that person hits the truck? Because I'll hear it and I'll, right, the vibration will pass through the truck. That means that hitting the truck caused every particle of the truck to move. They just didn't all move in unison or in the same direction. They vibrated, okay? And that's count, that counts. Also, will there be a dent in the back of the truck? That changed the shape of the truck. That counts as work. If everything was 100% efficient, yes. If it was a perfectly elastic collision, yes. There's basically no perfectly elastic collision. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, as we were just saying, motion or movement doesn't just mean the whole object moves. Okay, that there's some visible movement of the object. Okay. Um, when an object is compressed or stretched or any, any of the atoms within it are moved, okay, that counts as work being done. Okay? So changes in the shape of an object constitute an exertion of force and thus result in work and energy transfers. A spring is a prime example. Okay? If I compress a spring, I've changed its shape. I haven't necessarily moved the spring. The spring is still here. Right? But I have exerted a force over a distance and now there's energy stored in the spring. Okay? Uh, and this is actually something um, that people in the towing business have to be mindful of. How many people ever watched the show Highway Through Hell on the Discovery Channel? Okay, okay. So There's a lot of really good physics in that show. Um, one of the things they have to be mindful of is when they're flipping over 
semi trucks that are still attached to the trailer. Okay, because sometimes they're bent a bit, a lot. Okay, um, when they flip the cab over, sometimes the trailer doesn't come at exactly the same time, especially if it's a flat deck. Okay, as opposed to a big cargo box. Okay, uh, and so what happens is because the trailer is twisted. There can be a lot of spring elastic potential energy stored in the trailer and they have to be mindful of that okay because if they get it tipping too much the elastic nature of the trailer can actually cause it to over tip okay and, and come tipping back towards them okay everybody kind of follow me there it's one, it's one of the things they do have to watch for if they have to look at the condition of the trailer and see if it's bent in any way that has stored potential energy in it because that can be dangerous for them Okay. And similarly, when their cables are really, really stretched, okay, are really taut when they're towing something, okay, there's a lot of energy stored in those. When the cables snap, they have to be really careful because anything attached to those cables comes off, okay, and it can hit somebody and, and can kill them. So it's a dangerous, a dangerous thing to watch for. Okay, so work and heat are transfers of energy, okay? When the molecules of two objects originally at different temperatures come into contact with each other, they collide and transfer thermal energy. That's just review from day one, okay? That's the last we're gonna say about heat, okay? Uh, transfer of thermal energy is what we call heat, so heat's a transfer of energy as well, okay? All right, so heat's a transfer of thermal energy, but work is a transfer of? Mechanical, mechanical. It could be potential, it could be kinetic, but remember, we combine in mechanical energy, it is kinetic plus potential. That was Joseph Black's contribution. Okay. All right, so potential energy is energy due to position or condition. Good definition. Okay. We're going to be dealing with energy due to position most of the time. Elastic potential energy is energy due to condition okay, because of a stretched or compressed nature. Um, chemical energy is a potential energy due to condition as well. Is it flammable, explosive, etc.? Okay, So a rock perched on a cliff in a Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote cartoon has potential energy, as does a stretched rubber band, two of Wile E. Coyote's favorite ways to try and catch the Roadrunner. All right, how many people have ever watched like a Looney Tunes cartoon? Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, it, it almost always comes down to a rock on a cliff or rocket skates or or the, the rubber band, okay? Um, now, the, the dumb thing about, of course, the Looney Tunes cartoons is that gravity doesn't affect Wiley Coyote until he realizes he's not standing on anything, right? That the, the Roadrunner has to go like this and point, okay? okay? That he's not standing, then he falls. Um, obviously, that's not realistic, okay? But... Um, you fall and you make a hole in the ground. They often show like, you know, Wile E. Coyote making this like perfect Wile E. Coyote shaped hole in the ground. It's actually not all that unrealistic, okay? When you hit the ground, you have a lot of energy. Are you gonna do work on the ground? Yeah, and you're gonna change the ground's shape. It's gonna take a little bit of distance for the ground to slow you down because the ground has to do work on you. It has to take some of your energy away, okay? So it is realistic that you would make a hole in the ground, not like a meteor crater or anything like that, okay? But depending on the condition of the ground, you may sink in a fair distance. In fact, there was a story of a lady who was skydiving, her chute didn't open, but she fell into a, like, a, like a bog, okay? Not a swamp where she would have drowned, but like a bog that was really, really muddy. And she sank into the mud and actually survived, okay? With only minor injuries because the force exerted on her was less because the distance was greater. I mean, she had a certain amount of energy. The ground had to do a certain amount of work on her to stop her, okay? But because the ground allowed her to sink in a great deal, the force was decreased because D got bigger. I don't know. I think it's, I, I, I couldn't believe the story when I heard it, but okay, she must have sank into the mud quite a ways and landed on her back because if she landed on her face, she probably would have drowned in the mud. Have been my thinking, but okay. Well, if you're falling, right? If your chute doesn't open, you turn. Anyone ever tried the 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 simulated parachute where you're just in that big wind tunnel? Like it, if you watch those the skydivers and they hold that star position with their hands out, you wouldn't believe how hard that is. Okay, there is a lot of force acting on your hands. If you pull one hand in and you get slightly off balance, you turn right away. 
Okay, so they hold this position and they have to exert a lot of force. Their muscles are very tense. That's not a relaxed position at all. Okay, it's hard work to hold those positions. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, anything that has the ability to fall has gravitational potential energy. Okay, gravitational potential energy, this is on your formula sheet, is mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. Okay. Unless a question says otherwise, we're going to assume that G is always gravity on Earth, 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay? Unless it tells you, oh, this is on the moon where G is 1.6, or this is on uh, Mars where it's 3.27, okay? or whatever. Okay? But we're going to assume that most of the time it's on Earth and it's 9.81. Really? I've never heard of that. It's like a weird phenomenon. I'm not sure what it's called, but they're called mystery spots. And it's like you can like kind of walk on the walls of it. Like it's 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 how you do explain. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I I'll have to look it up. I I don't know how that would work, but uh, okay. Um. So, I mean, it's, it is true that G isn't 9.81 everywhere. It isn't 9.81 here, okay? It's like 9.79 here, okay? Well, it's because the Earth isn't perfectly round, okay? Um, so, the Earth is slightly ellipsoid, okay, like so. Um, so, that means that when you are at the North Pole, you are closer to the center of the Earth than you are when you stand at the equator, Okay. Everyone follow me there? Okay, and the distance you are from the center of the Earth affects the acceleration due to gravity. Um, so you've got kind of this, this, that the acceleration due to gravity does change. 9.81 is an average of all places on Earth. Okay, but believe it or not, you are actually heavier on the top of Mount Everest than you are here at sea level. Okay, standing on the highest point on the Earth's surface, you weigh more than you do standing at sea level at the equator, because at sea level at the equator, you're actually further from the center of the earth than you are on the top of Mount Everest. Okay? Yeah, the earth is that far out of round, okay? But you have to also consider that even though we all look at Mount Everest and go, wow, that's like this totally huge mountain. If you looked at the scale of the earth, okay, and put all of the topographical relief on it to proper scale, Mount Everest wouldn't even look like a pimple okay on the surface of the earth okay there's really only like one or two places in the entire solar system where there's a there's a formation big enough on the surface to actually make a deformation that is visible okay and that would be olympus mons on mars that big giant volcano okay the whole tharsis region of mars is like a big giant hernia okay on the surface of mars it's a big hump okay yeah. okay so uh, gravitational potential energy is the potential energy of an object due to its position, okay? And we talked about this example here, okay? Talked about which takes more energy, lifting the rock to the top or pushing the rock up the ramp to the top. Well, they take the same amount of energy. They take the same amount of work because a rock of the same mass sitting in that position has the same amount of energy. Yes, she wouldn't be able to get up, yeah. She would have to walk beside it and push it up, not walk on it. That would be a neat trick. Okay. Um, well, even with even with suction cups, if there's no friction, the suction cup doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it'll it'll pull against, but it'll slide right away. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, let, let's say we coated it with Teflon and sprayed it down with cooking oil and then you walk beside and pushed it up, then it would be easy. Okay. But I mean, the Egyptians didn't build the pyramids with aliens help. They built big, long ramps. Sorry, spoiler alert for all of you like alien conspiracy theorists. Okay. Um, what did the, what did the uh, Egyptians have a lot of? Sand and slaves. Okay. <laughs> they had lots of both. So you build ramps that are a mile and a half long. Okay, and you put these big giant rocks on them and you put the rocks on logs and you just have slaves pull, okay, or push depending on the on the condition, okay, and you have them pull and when a tree gets to the end of the rock, you have a couple of slaves grab it and pull it around, put it back on the front, okay, and you keep rolling this big rock up this huge ramp until you get to the top. 
Um, that's why you didn't want to be a slave, I guess. Squish, yeah. Um, remember, it's only going to it's only going to roll back until it's off the logs, right? And then they got a problem, right? Because if all, if it gets off the logs, how do you get it back onto the logs? It's a big giant brick, right? So I would imagine there was a lot of quality control, a lot of whips and yelling and screaming and stuff. Okay. Okay. In this situation here, with the pulley, okay, I have a five kilogram mass attached to a three kilogram mass. Okay, which one of these masses has the energy that's going to drive this system? The five kilogram mass. Why? No, it has potential. You're right. It's hanging. The other one's sitting on a surface. And while if I knocked it off the surface, it could fall, I'm not doing that. Okay, it's just sitting there. It essentially has no condition that would allow it. It's in the middle of the table. They do, but this one doesn't have the potential to help the system any, right? This one has this one here because it's hanging has the potential to help this system. If I let it go, it's gonna fall. Okay. The ground. They give you a reference point. Your reference point is usually the ground, unless you started on the tenth floor of a building and moved to the top floor, and then they say, in reference to the tenth floor. How much have how much work have you done? Well, then you wouldn't consider the ground. Then you would consider the tenth floor as the start. Yeah, or wherever the question defines it. If it doesn't define it, it's the ground. Yeah. Okay. So right now, the five kilogram ball has all the energy that's going to drive this system. When it falls, will it fall at nine point eight one meters per second squared? Why not? It's got to do work on the three kilogram mass, okay? It can't just fall. It can't convert all of its potential energy into kinetic. Some of its potential energy has to get this thing moving. And even if this was on a frictionless surface, this would still not fall at 9.81 meters per second squared because it would take some energy to move this thing over there because it's going to exert a force through the, through the string over a distance, taking some of that energy away, all right? Now, because this thing is five kilograms and it's two meters above the ground, okay, we have we can calculate the potential energy in this system. Mass times acceleration due to gravity times height. So five times nine point eight one times two. Two meters. Everybody with me there? So that's gonna be ninety-eight point one newtons, I think. Or ninety-eight point one joules, sorry. You can double check my math, but I'm pretty sure that's the number. Okay. Um, so when this thing falls. It's not going to keep all 98.1 joules of energy. Some of it will go to here. But will this whole system still have 98.1 joules? Yes. Okay. That part can't change. The system has that much energy. It's just not all going to stay in the same place. Energy can move from one point to another in the system, from one object to another in the system. Okay. But it, if it leaves the system, then the system has done work on something else. Um, yes, we don't generally deal with it after it's gone over the pulley because usually it does work on the pulley because it strikes the pulley. Uh, 